I just wanted to spend a few short uh, minutes, hopefully, to tee up uh, the presentation. Uh, first of all, I'm not Walter Mugden, and uh, this is the title that we gave uh, to Walter and realized that uh, the sort of the second part of this, the relevance to uh, the, the lower estuary, was something that we really sort of needed to tee up uh, down here in the New York Harbor area. And we're going to talk about, Walter's going to talk about those little play toys and down here in the harbor we've got these big things that operate and believe it or not these two things uh, indeed um, are linked together. Uh, I'm going to start out, uh, it was two year, almost two years ago, uh, well I guess a little over two years ago that some of you uh, sat in this room and heard the results of the contamination assessment reduction project, uh, better known as CARP. In fact, uh, some of you that were either here listening to what was going on or participated in that effort are again here today. And the, the purpose of that effort um, had to do with looking at the sources uh, and the fate of a variety of contaminants that are, were causing and still continue to cause uh, problems down in, in uh, here in New York Harbor, and in particular problems that relate to uh, dredging interests. And um, that dredging problem is both, a, and PCBs associated with it are both an ecosystem problem and a financial problem because uh, the PCBs being one of a couple of contaminants uh, that are causing uh, the, the ocean dumping or the remediation of the offshore uh, dump site to slow down to some degree. And the consequences of that are that it costs a lot more money to take the muds out of New York Harbor and put them on land than it does to take them offshore and put them at the historic area remediation site. And here, this is just a, a shot to show you that, you know, we're more than tenfold increase in, in the cost that it takes to dredge uh, and put material on the upland versus uh, offshore. So one of the, one of the actions uh, that was contemplated uh, within a bi-state dredging program that was authorized by both governors of New York and New Jersey back in 1996 and received some considerable funding uh, through the Port Authority uh, was the, the CARP program. And uh, with that effort, uh, the, the basic idea there was to say, let's look at the sources uh, of PCBs and other things, trace them back to their sources, and then put them in, in a, in a framework that we could begin to look at future scenarios um, uh, and, and better manage the system. So with that, that took uh, quite a bit of, of sampling uh, the entire region to look at not only the ambient concentrations of PCBs and other things, uh, but also to look at the quantities of, of contaminants that were coming out of uh, rivers, uh, or stormwater treatment plants out of the atmosphere and being exchanged with the sediments on the bottom. And then that information was used uh, to uh, refine some models uh, that uh, look something like this. And uh, by the way, I just wanted to point out, this is uh, one of our chief chemists uh, through the project, Simon Litton, who uh, to our chagrin will be retiring next month from, from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And our modeling was chiefly done by uh, Kevin, Dr. Kevin Farley from Manhattan College and Robin Miller from Hydroqual, who are also here today. What were the key findings of the CAR program? And I was, uh, I was surprised when we, when we met here two years ago and we presented the findings with regard to PCBs and it didn't, it didn't sort of stimulate or startle that many people. Maybe it did, we didn't hear a whole lot of feedback. But let me go through uh, three key findings that relate to PCBs. First being that the upper Hudson is the dominant source of PCBs to the lower estuary. Upper Hudson PCBs are dispersed throughout the lower estuary. And third, that if the loadings continue at current levels, which I'll get into in a moment, much of the harbor's surficial sediments will continue to remain HARS unsuitable or unsuitable from the standpoint of the ocean dumping criteria. And I'd just like to give you illustrations of each of these points. First of all, this is a map uh, that you can find on EPA's um, uh, super, uh, Hudson River Superfund site that delineates the 200 mile uh, Superfund site from Glens Falls all the way down here to the Battery. And what I'm showing here is, is the results of modeling 
uh, that if we keep the loads of PCBs uh, constant uh, from all the various sources, and we take a look at PCBs in sediments downriver, uh, we find some interesting uh, trends. First of all, if we go about 15 miles south of Albany, we find that 100% of the PCBs in the sediments below Albany originate from the upper Hudson. Now, a small bit of this comes from the Mohawk, but by far the largest percent, greater than 90%, is coming from the upper Hudson uh, Superfund site. As we move down river another 50 miles or so, and we're getting into the Beacon uh, area, 98% of the PCBs and sediments are coming from upriver. As we get down here, uh, down into the lower 14 miles, uh, we're finding that about 67% of PCBs are traceable back to the upper Hudson. So just changing the colors a little bit and, a little, and showing a little bit more detail on these pies. Again, here's the lower 14 miles of the, of the river. Now, if we go beyond the boundaries of the Superfund site into the upper bay and into Newark Bay, we find that in the upper bay, just again outside our wind, or outside the doors here, uh, that roughly half of the PCBs are from upriver. And I think more, most, the most striking result that we saw was that um, over, over a third of the PCBs that are now in Newark Bay, again, the shipping capital of the harbor, um, results from upriver uh, PCBs. And that's, the Hudson River has a greater influence than the Passaic River in terms of PCBs in Newark Bay. So a dominant uh, influence in PCBs are moving around. From the standpoint of modeling, what we wanted to look at was what the current conditions uh, were today and then take a look at what happens if, and this, this is we started before uh, the remedy, um, the remedy was being contemplated and, and the record of decision had just had been signed, uh, but certainly the work had not gone underway. So I'd like to take you through our sort of initial conditions, which, which we think reflect the time frame between 1998 and 2002. And this shows some of the model results of running those loads that, that were calculated uh, in 98 through 2002. And the colors here are taking the, the information and converting it into the um, HARS specific criteria for PCB bioaccumulation. And I think the message here is that if it's pink or red, it means it's essentially failing the hard specific criteria. The lighter that it gets, you're sort of on the cusp of whether you fail or not. And as you move into the greens, you're in a, you know, you're you're in the, the PCB friendly world related to to dredging. And you can see the entire harbor uh, is really a problematic in terms of PCBs and its bioaccumulation. If we don't do anything upriver and let those current loads go, this is what the picture looks like. And one of the interesting things that uh, we found was when we were working with our modelers on a scenario uh, for what that no action looked like, we said, well, you know, you need to put in the natural attenuation that's occurring uh, at the, in the upper Hudson. We need to sort of decrease that load to make it, make it consistent with what's happening. And I think Kevin Farley came back to us and said, uh, you know, I'm looking at the data and we're not seeing a decrease in concentrations of PCBs up in, up in the Waterford area. And after some more analysis, um, we became convinced that the data that, that exists did not show this attenuation that was occurring um, uh, as PCBs were coming from the upper river down over the Troy Dam. So we decided to keep the levels of PCBs um, fairly constant. It varies with, with water years and so forth, but we didn't see any evidence of the attenuation that, that people had talked about and had modeled. And in fact, I think Walter may, may get to that point in his presentation that uh, even with further information uh, since the, the phase one, um, I think that, that assumption was probably pretty good because we are not seeing that drop off. So, if we keep those loads going, here's what happens. Again, we see that some of the harbor is getting better and cleaner with regard to PCBs, but are some of our major shipping channels like in Newark Bay and the Arthur Kill are still remaining HARS problematic 40 years from now. 